Corinthians chapter 5, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And all the old things have passed away and everything has become new. And that means that someone who is, is saved and is converted by Jesus, that their life changes. Oh, yes. Amen. That there, there's a real change that takes place. And sometimes it's a radical change. Yes. Um, and uh, one of the things that happens is that we stop using our money for the devil. Amen. And we start using it for God. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so when we give in an offering like this, what we're doing is we're, we're facilitating God's work. Amen. Amen. God's work is all about saving people. Yes. It's all about helping people to turn away from, from the sin that's destroying them and, and to receive forgiveness from God so that they can, uh, you know, not only be blessed in this life, but have eternal life uh, in the next life. And really, that's what it's all about. That's what God is into. And that's what we're into. Praise God. And so I want to encourage you, uh, let Jesus uh, radically transform your life. Amen. Let him change uh, how you use your money that God has given you. Use it for good instead of evil. Amen. And you'll see. There'll be, a, there'll be a real difference that's made in your life. The direction of your life will change. And that will actually, it'll help you to fall in love with Jesus and to fall in love with his church. Because when you put your money in the kingdom of God, Jesus said that your heart will follow your money. He said, for where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Praise God. So let's, let's let that uh, sink into our hearts and may God help us to give faithfully and liberally to his church. And so uh, we uh, are, you know, we've, we've got a website now. And so uh, you can actually go to the website and uh, give online if you're so inclined, praise God. So let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our offering. Our heads are bowed. Brother George, would you ask God's blessing? Oh Lord, I thank you God for we could be here today to be in your presence, Lord. I pray that you bless our tithes and offerings, Lord. I pray that you'd move in this service, Lord. I thank you for everything that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We bring the sacrifice. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house. musicians and singers we appreciate you Lord to God let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 12 Revelation chapter 12 thank you Jesus appreciate uh, God's faithful people part of the song service hallelujah uh, I want to minister from the book of Revelation this, this morning, and most likely uh, this, this uh, is going to be more than one message uh, that I bring to you this day, and looking at the world that we live in today and how things are going um, it can be kind of disturbing, and so I want to, I want to hopefully help to, you know, bring some perspective to the craziness of our world today, and you know, to understand the big picture of the things that are happening. It's necessary to understand the teaching of God's word, because there is more happening in our world today than meets the eye. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. The pandemic, it's it's kind of winding down. Uh, but you look at the, the conflict in, that's going on in Israel, that it's kind of settled down now. Uh, but there are things that are happening. And so as Christians, we have to learn to look at world events through the lens of Scripture. And uh, it's possible to focus on uh, uh, political events, uh, world politics and 
finances and you know financial news and and uh, cryptocurrency and and all the things that are taking place and and to look at all those things and form your opinion on what's going on in the world but if you neglect or reject what the bible has to say about it you'll never really understand what's going on and the reason for that is because there is a spiritual reality that is being played out before our eyes the scriptures that we're going to read today in, in Revelation 12 encompass a vast swath of, of human and heavenly history and also future events. And so this is kind of a historical yet prophetic message. And uh, I want you to know that there is a cosmic struggle going on in the spiritual realm. And like it or not, we humans are stuck in the middle of this war between God and his angels and the devil and his angels. And so I want to preach a message I've entitled War of the Worlds. And I stole the title from, it was it H.G. Wells? And so uh, War of the Worlds, Revelation 12, verse 1 through 12. And then we're going to also read uh, Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15. So let's read this beginning in verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems or crowns on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. That's obviously Jesus. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a Place prepared by God that they should feed her their 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed out water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the great dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're asking for grace and help, we're asking for understanding and revelation, God, that will encourage and strengthen your church. Build them up, Lord God. Give us encouragement in these last days to be faithful to serve Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So I want to begin by talking about the scope of our text, <clears throat> meaning what ground this passage covers, this chapter of uh, Revelation. And I believe that this covers the entirety of human history from the casting of Satan out of heaven to the creation of man and into and uh, through the great tribulation. These are events that if you've never read about them, it's hard to, it's hard to really grasp the understanding. But what we have here is a cast of characters. We have the father, we have the son, and we have their angels. We have Lucifer and his angels. We have mankind who are the offspring of Adam and Eve. In here is the nation of Israel, specifically, and the bride of Christ, which is his church. That, that would be you and I. And so these verses that we read in chapter 12 kind of give us a snapshot of heavenly and earthly events of things that have happened in the past, things that are happening right now in our world, and of things that will be happening soon. Okay, and so, you know, this is the scope of the text. It covers a broad spectrum of time from, from before the world was created all the way into and through the Great Tribulation. <clears throat> and so, there's a timeline of events that have taken place, and we're not sure exactly how these all worked out, but uh, to start with, there was the historical fall of Lucifer. Satan was not always the character that's described here in, in Revelation 12, 9. Look at that description of him again. It says, so the great dragon, you know, there's, there's, these, are, these are descriptions of him. The great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, that, that would be the character that was in the Garden of Eden, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and the angels, his angels were cast out with him. So Satan wasn't always this, this wicked, nasty uh, character. You know, we've seen pictures of dragons. They've made multitudes of movies about dragons, and it tells us that, that, that before he was that, he was a brilliant, beautiful angel of God by the name of Lucifer. <coughs> Lucifer is where we get the word loose, which is light. He was an angel of light. The word Lucifer, the name Lucifer, actually means star of the morning. You know the 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 morning star, and so uh, he was he was beautiful in creation, and in the book of Isaiah we find a description of his fall from heaven, and it says this in Isaiah fourteen verse twelve. It says, "How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning." So you know his origin was in heaven. He was a holy angel of God. It says, now you are cut down to the ground. Remember the scripture says he was cast to the earth. You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He was an ambitious fellow, don't you think? He said, I also will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And it says, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, which is hell, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of the prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory, but every everyone in his own house, but you are cast out of your grave, like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword. You go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trodden underfoot. So that describes the fall 
of Lucifer. He was a glorious angel, but he was lifted up in pride. He was the first rebellious spirit. Uh, he wanted to be above God, and uh, and he did not fall alone. In, in Revelation 12, verse 4, it says, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And so this... This is, uh, you know, uh, widely believed by Bible scholars that when, when Lucifer fell from heaven, when he was cast out of heaven, that a third of God's angels fell with him. And so, so this is in our text in Revelation 12. It's, there is a, a brief description of what happened uh, to Satan or to Lucifer before he became Satan. <clears throat> and so... He is a hateful creature. And in the creation of the earth and of mankind, we, we read this in Genesis 1 and 2. You can take time to read about the creation. We're not sure what happened first, whether Satan was cast out first or whether creation took place. But we do know, however, that, uh, that in the Garden of Eden, Satan assumed, he either assumed the form of or possessed the serpent that spoke to Eve and deceived her, okay? And so the name Satan is, is basically the Old Testament uh, name for him. And that name means adversary. It means enemy. And, you know, I'm here to tell you that Satan is God's enemy. And he is mankind's enemy. And at the fall of Eden, there began a spiritual struggle between mankind and Satan that will end only when he's cast into the lake of fire. So he's become an enemy of God and an enemy of man. And the Bible is the record of the things that have happened in the past. It's also the record of what is going to happen in the future. In Revelation 1, in the first two verses, it tells us uh, the, the purpose of the book. And in the first, it says in verse 1 and 2, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel, to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So it says that these are the, the things that are going to come to pass shortly. <clears throat> this was a record. The Bible tells us very clearly that this book was written to, to explain and to bring light to uh, to. Uh, those who read it so that they can understand what is happening. The the word revelation, uh, you know, it sounds, it can sound kind of ominous, it can sound kind of mysterious, but the word revelation really, all it means is to reveal. To reveal something that was not known before, something that was not seen before. So when we talk about this, this creature, Satan, that the Bible says is a, is a uh, evil spirit who is the enemy of God and the enemy of man. We have to understand that through the history of the world, God has, God has been working and allowing him to do certain things, but it is for a purpose, to bring God's purpose to, to pass in the very end. And so I want you to think about this because in, uh, in uh, uh, David Jeremiah's book, uh, agents of the apocalypse he, he writes a very interesting uh, uh, and a very succinct statement of Satan's place in history and in the future and so I want to read a little bit of this to you it's a it's a it, it's a few paragraphs so it kind of covers the history of what Satan has done it the heading of this, Passage is Satan's purpose. 
from the very beginning, Satan's purpose has been to destroy the child of the woman. What woman? Well, that's the woman in Genesis chapter 3. Remember, if you read about the temptation, uh, God questioned Adam and he said, it was the wife you gave me. And he questioned the wife and she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so this is what God said to the serpent. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So that is the, the very first prophetic word of the Messiah who would come through the seed of the woman. And uh, notice that there's no seed of the man here because this is, this is a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It's a prophecy because there's no human father. There is God the Father. He, he is the father of Jesus Christ. And so that's why he said he's, he's the son of God. And so, so in Jeremiah's book, David Jeremiah's book, he said, Satan's purpose has been to destroy the child of the woman. And so in our scripture that we read, we read about a woman who is in birth, in child, uh, in labor, and she's about to give birth. And it says that this evil demon, this dragon, it said, stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. It says she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and his throne. That's Jesus Christ. We know he was crucified. He was raised from the dead. And at the right time, he ascended back to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God okay. at the throne. Okay, so let me, let me keep reading. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth <clears throat> to devour her child as soon as it was born. When God told Satan in the Garden of Eden that the seed of the woman shall bruise your head, Satan began his campaign to eradicate that promised seed. Knowing from prophecy that the promised one would spring from Israel, the adversary did everything he could to keep that nation from being formed. He incited Esau to attempt to kill his brother Jacob, who would father the 12 tribes of Israel. When that failed, he incited Pharaoh to murder all the Jewish baby boys in Egypt. Had either Jacob or Moses not survived, the nation of Israel would not have existed. At one point in Israel's history, Satan almost succeeded. The promised redeemer was to come through the royal line of David. After David's descendant, King Jehoshaphat, died, a series of intrigues and murders eliminated the entire Davidic line except King ah Ahaziah and his family. Ahaziah was also murdered, and the queen mother, Athaliah, usurped the throne and killed all of his children, finally ending the royal line, or so she thought. But the high priest's wife managed to hide Ahaziah's youngest son, Joash, until he could be crowned. That In that little boy, the lone male survivor of Israel's royalty, resided the promised seed and the ultimate purpose of God. You can read that story in 2 Chronicles 22 and 23. Thwarted but undaunted, Satan incited the wicked Haman to plot the extermination of all the Jews. But God raised up Esther for such a time as this to expose Haman's scheme and the promised seed was spared. When the prophesied child was finally born, Satan instilled fear and hatred in King Herod, who had all the babies in Bethlehem murdered. He thought that surely the promised seed would be slain in this insidious act of infanticide. But the sovereign hand of God intervened and directed Joseph to flee with his family to Egypt, thus sparing Jesus' life. 
Immediately after Jesus' baptism, Satan confronted him in the wilderness with three famous temptations. But Jesus rendered his adversary powerless with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. After this failure, the devil made two attempts to murder Jesus by proxy. He tried to coerce the people of Nazareth to throw Jesus off the top of a hill. And then he fanned the hatred of the scribes and Pharisees until they tried to stone him to death. But each time Jesus miraculously escaped unharmed. Finally, on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock, Satan saw the fruition of his centuries-long campaign when the Son of God, the promised seed, succumbed to a bloody death on a cross. When Christ's mangled body was wrapped in linen, embalmed in spices, and sealed in a sepulcher, Satan thought he had won. But God had purposed for this promised child to rescue and rule the nations, and God never changes his purposes on the third day he raised Jesus from the dead, thwarting Satan's purpose. Hallelujah. Thank Amen. you, Lord. Amen. That, that, that's a powerful explanation and statement of the, the, uh, the events uh, in the Bible of what Satan has been up to. And I want you to know that, that even though the Bible says that Satan has been defeated by Jesus Christ. The war is still going on. That's right. Amen. And the reason the war is still going on is that because though at the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Satan's power was robbed from him, that, that was a verdict that was declared by God. But like in a court of law, you know, it's kind of a legal uh, proceeding kind of thing. Uh, a person can go to trial and... Uh, uh, be found guilty, and a sentence can be pronounced. But how many know the sentence has to be carried out? Yeah. It has to be, you know, uh, completed. And there's a process. There's a time in between uh, the sentence being declared uh, and it being carried out. The death and resurrection of Jesus was, in essence, God saying, devil, you lost. But there's a time in between. So far, it's been about 2,000 years since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so as we read these scriptures, what we can take away from this, and I, you know, I have to say there's much more to say about this. In the cosmic war between God and Satan, as you read the Bible, you see that God is clearly the, the mightier of the two. God is clearly uh, the, the, the victor in all of this. We know from reading the scripture that Satan loses. Amen. <coughs> As you read Revelation 12, it talks about the persecution of the woman. It says, when the dragon saw in verse 13 that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the child. And then the last verse says, the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, in the great tribulation, the, the church, you and I, the bride of Christ, is going to be gone, going to be raptured, going to be taken to heaven. And when the church is, is removed, what God is going to do is he, according to the scriptures, what God is going to do is he's going to turn his attention back onto his own people, the nation of Israel. They're not forsaken. And, and so I was, I was kind of, you know, thinking about this and some of the headlines that I've seen recently. Uh, as many of you may know, there, there was a, a ceasefire declared in, uh, in Egypt against, I mean, in Israel against Hamas. And historically, uh, when when Muslims agree to a ceasefire, it's just so they can rearm and start again later. That's just you know that's been their historical pattern, and I don't see any reason that that's going to change. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that is that uh, there's been an uptick in uh, in uh, anti-Semitic uh, actions taking place here in the United States, and I don't know about the rest of the world. I haven't read uh, uh, other things, but. 
But there are people who are who are targeting Jewish people right now. And there's a, there's a you know it's always been there this this hatred of the Jewish people. And as we read these scriptures, we understand something that's what is behind that is satanic. You know, and and in the in the great tribulation, the Jewish nation is going to be greatly persecuted. They're going to be greatly persecuted. It says the dragon was enraged with the woman because she escaped and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. So that's that's something that is that is going to be happening. Um, and uh, there's there's more to come. And so here's the thing I want to leave you with. And that is this, that since all mankind is in the middle of this war, we all have to choose which side we're going to be on. We have to decide, am I going to be on the Lord's side? Or am I going to be with the rest of the world joining forces with the enemy? See, there's only two choices. You know, in this world, there's, there's, it's black and it's white, good and evil. Righteousness and wickedness. It's either God or the devil. And there's no middle ground. There's no place in between. You have to understand that Satan hates God and he hates you. Which is, is totally uh, the opposite of God's feeling toward us. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so the essence of the gospel is victory over Satan. You know, Satan, the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. Um, John wrote that, that he has, uh, he rules in the earth, that he's got a, he's got a, a, a dominion that uh, he has taken in the earth. You know, when God made Adam and Eve, he made them the rulers. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Yeah. You go back and read Revelation, uh, and I mean, uh, Genesis in chapter two, he says, have dominion over the earth. That means you rule. This is your domain. You know, you're the kings. You're the royalty on the earth. But when they sinned, when they, when they, uh, you know, uh, fell in temptation, they ceded that power to the devil and he stepped right in. Because how many know that uh, nature abhors a vacuum? Somebody's going to rule. And they, they gave that up. They were deceived, greatly deceived. Sad to say. You know, one of the things that Satan told them was, oh, he doesn't want you to, to eat that fruit because then you'll be as God's or you'll be like God, which was his ambition. Remember we read that in, in Isaiah 14? That was his ambition, to be like God, to be above God. And so they were so greatly deceived because if you read the scriptures in Genesis at the creation, he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And they, they, you know, they were so deceived because they were never going to be more like God than they were right then. They were already in his likeness. They were already in his image. And so every false religion has this idea that you're going to become like God. You're going to be gods. You know, you study the Mormon religion. They teach that, that uh, you know, as you go into eternity as a faithful Mormon, that one day you're going to have your own planet and you're going to become little gods. I'm not sure where they got that. It's not from the Bible. I guess I, I am sure where they got it. Yeah. From the same one who told Adam and Eve, you're going to be as God. Right. Amen. And so our takeaway this morning is this. I have to choose who I'm going to be with. Right. Am I going to be with the loser? Who is the enemy? Who is Satan, that dragon, that serpent of old? The devil, 
or am I going to be with God? Who loves me. God who sacrificed his son for me. See, when you understand this, and you look at what's going on in the world, you don't have to live in fear anymore. Amen. You don't have to really worry about what's happening in the world. I mean, we, we like to know and we like to be informed that that's not the same thing as worry. That's not the same thing as being afraid. See, God is going to bring the victory in the end. Amen. And I just want to encourage you, choose to follow Jesus. Because that is where safety lies. Amen. That's where eternal life is. If, if you don't choose Jesus, you by default choose the wicked one. You know, we have people saying, well, I don't need to believe. I don't need to believe in that. I don't need to, I don't need to go to church to be saved. I don't need... You know, and you know, people believe all kinds of stuff, but I'm telling you, Satan blinds the minds of people. Oh, yes, he does. He blinds their minds so that the, the glorious light of the gospel doesn't shine on them. And this morning, as I preach this message, my hope is that you will you will open your eyes and say, you know what, there's more going on here than I understand. It's been going on from before time began, before the world began. But God has it in control. Amen. God is the one who knows the beginning from the end and who is going to accomplish his will and his purpose no matter what Satan does. Amen. Amen. Satan doesn't really understand the mind of God. But I'll tell you something. God loves every one of us. And he gives us these words so that we can know what to do. And we can know how to live this life. And I encourage you, follow Jesus. Amen. That's the bottom line. Follow Jesus. Yeah. You'll make it. Amen. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads together. We're going to bring our service to a close. You've come here today, perhaps, and you know, you you watch the news or you hear reports and you don't know what to think about it. You know, where are we going? Where is this headed? You know, you, you, you see that, uh, you know, if, you're, if you have your finger on the, the pulse of world politics, that, you know, we're headed to a one world government. We're headed to what the Bible says is going to happen. It's all, it's all coming to pass. And if that's true, that those things are coming to pass as the Bible has prophesied, then the rest is going to happen. But what's important, most important of all for us right now, is that, is that we be right with God. That we choose to believe in Jesus Christ and follow Him. I'm not talking about joining the church. I'm not talking about that at all. What I'm talking about is you making a decision to follow Jesus today. To believe in Him and to trust your life into His hands. I'm trying to help you to see that there is a very real enemy who wants to take you. He wants to keep you in your sin long enough so that you'll die in that condition and God will have no choice but to judge you because of your sin. And that's not God's desire. God's desire is to forgive you. God's desire is to wash away the record, you know, to take the long list of sins in your life and just wash them away through the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary's cross. That's why the cross is so powerful. Because of what Jesus did there. He shed his blood. He died to forgive sin. And he rose again to conquer death. So that you and I could live. That's love. That's real love. God proved his love for you and me. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen.
And so as we've come together this morning, perhaps you're here and you're not you're not right with God. You you you're not sure that if you were to die today, you would make heaven your home. Well, I have good news for you. And the good news is that you can be sure. And I'm going to pray a prayer with you. It's a very simple prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. To receive forgiveness for your sins. And you can leave this place this morning knowing that you're forgiven. Not because I said so, but because the Bible says so. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And guess what? We won't have to pay for our sins anymore because Jesus already paid for them. And so if you want to pray with me, you want to give your life to Christ, I'd like you to do one thing for me. Just lift your hand and signal to God saying, yes, pray with me. Thank you, I see you. God bless you. Who else? Anyone else? Quickly. Just lift your hand. We'll pray. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray. Anyone else? Quickly raise your hand. Say yes, Pastor. Pray for me. Pray with me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Okay, so while our heads are bowed, you raised your hand. I want you to say this with me. Say it from your heart. If you're watching later on online, you can pray the prayer with me as well. Just know God loves you. If you didn't raise your hand, but you want to pray the prayer, you pray it between you and God. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, that you died on the cross to take away my sins. I confess to you, Lord, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Jesus, come into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Help me to serve you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me strength. Give me understanding of your word and help me to follow you from now on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God knows. God sees. God looks into our hearts. The Bible says he's not like men who just look on the outward appearance. He looks into our hearts and he sees what's truly there. If you prayed that, you meant it. God knows and God forgives you because that's who he is. That's what he does. We're going to change the order of our service and we're going to take some time. We're going to open our altar for prayer. You know, sometimes we can, we can be really concerned about what's going on in our world. And I just want to encourage you as a Christian, read the Bible, study the Word of God, be filled with the Holy Spirit so you can understand what it says. And God will give you strength, God will give you wisdom to be able to make the right decisions that you need to make to follow Jesus in this life. Amen. We don't need to be afraid. We need to look at what's going on and say, oh, Jesus Christ is coming soon. He's coming soon, and that's what we look for. And that's what we look forward to. So we're going to take some time, and we're going to open the altars for prayer. If you want to come and find a place to pray at the altar, I invite you to come. If you prayed that prayer with me, and you want to come and just pray at the altar and thank God for forgiving your sins, you come too. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing that song, This Is My Desire, one more time to honor you, and these altars are open if you want to come find a place to pray. Amen. God will meet you here. This is my desire to honor
give that praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you and bless you, my God. For your name is over the name. Shiko Lobo Shanana Kango Lobo. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the power of your resurrection. Thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus. God, we give you praise. God, we praise you and we worship you. Amen. We bring our service to a close.